Hello, and welcome to the Nursing Economics Podcast Series. This series provides extended content relating to articles published in the journal, such as interviews and roundtable discussions. Before we get started, we have a special offer for our listeners. You can save 50% off one- and two-year subscriptions to Nursing Economics. Simply visit nurseneconomics.net, click subscribe, and enter promo code NECSAVE50 to take advantage of this special discount. Hospitals continue to experience negative margins, with hospital expenses decreasing slightly since the start of the pandemic, but not enough to address impacted volumes and revenues. As a result, issues regarding hospital and health system debt and financial sustainability weigh heavily on healthcare administrators. Hospital finances, and specifically the management of bonds and debt, are of vital concern, particularly in light of the elimination of CARES Act funding and the forthcoming expiration of the Federal Public Health Emergency COVID-19 plan. In this episode, Nursing Economics Editorial Board Member Dr. Therese Fitzpatrick talks with leading healthcare expert Lisa Goldstein about the rising pressures to maintain financial sustainability as hospital margins react to post-pandemic admissions and related adjustments. We are pleased to present this important conversation between Dr. Fitzpatrick and Ms. Goldstein. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nursing Economics Podcast related to hospital finances and specifically bonds and managing debt. We are all very familiar with the important issues regarding hospital and health system finances. We have all become familiar with the news of growing concerns and the financial outlook, particularly given the fact that the CARES dollars have been eliminated and that the declaration of the federal public health emergency is beginning to be unwound. This is leading to growing concerns over hospitals and health systems ability to manage their debt. In fact, some analyses of over a thousand hospitals ending the calendar year 22 and going into 2023 have demonstrated that despite very modest margin improvements in November and December, suggesting a positive trend heading into this new year, 2022 was the worst financial year since the start of the pandemic. Approximately half of U.S. hospitals finished the year with a negative margin as growth in expenses outpaced revenue increases. In fact, hospitals have faced prolonged increases in labor expenses over the last several years. The increases were driven in part by a competitive labor market, as well as hospitals needing to rely on more expensive contract labor to meet staffing demands. Increased lengths of stay due to a decline in discharges also negatively affected hospital margins. The front door of the hospital continues to shift away from the emergency department as volumes have decreased over the past year. Additionally, hospitals have experienced increased outpatient volume, including in surgical settings, meaning that our patients are seeking care and that care is being delivered in outpatient venues. Success in 2023 is going to be tied to what we have learned in this past year. Expense pressures are likely to recede in 2023. However, that will be the result of hospitals embracing better workforce management strategies, more secure, stable supply lines, and learning the ability to negotiate more effectively, negotiate with payers. All of these coupled together should lead to a better financial year in 2023. Hospitals should continue to leverage their outpatient footprint and improve relationships with post-acute settings to maximize their current patient volumes. So why is it important that we talk about this today? Well, As nurse executives, 
we have a fiduciary responsibility to our organizations to help manage the financial impact of all of these issues that I've just described. We also serve on our hospital boards of directors and many of us on the finance committee. We may also serve on boards of other organizations, both profit and not-for-profit. So to help us understand the issues related to hospital debt and specifically to hospital bonds, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today. Lisa Goldstein is a nationally recognized analyst, speaker, writer, and expert on non-for-profit healthcare. She is a member of the Treasury and Capital Market Practice at Kaufman Hall Associates and is part of their thought leadership team. She is an MSRB Series 50 qualified municipal advisor representative who can perform municipal advisor services on behalf of Kaufman Hall. Prior to joining the firm, Lisa spent more than 30 years at Moody's Investor Service, including 10 years serving as an Associate Managing Director. She managed the rating agency's U.S. non-for-profit healthcare team and oversaw credit rating and monitoring for 350 non-for-profit hospitals. Lisa has been quoted by national media, including CNN, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. She is a regular speaker at regional and national healthcare conferences and serves as a guest lecturer at Harvard, New York University, and Rutgers. She has authored numerous industry reports and is a faculty member for the Governance Institute. She holds an MPA in public and not-for-profit finance, management, and policy from the New York University's Wagner Graduate School of Public Services. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. I look forward to your insights on this really, really important topic. Thank you, Therese. It's a wonderful bio that you read. I'm tired just thinking about it, but I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And, you know, it never hurts for us as nurse executives within our healthcare systems to do a, a bit of a reminder on how hospitals fund their capital needs. And later in our conversation, we're going to get into to the issue of bonds and sort of what you are observing in the market. So let me start our conversation by asking, how do health systems typically fund their capital needs? Great question, great way to start the conversation. And as we know, and as uh, our listeners know, hospitals are indeed very capital intense enterprises, technology, patient services, High tech, state of the art is what it's all about, of course, in the medical field, right, to improve the health status of the patient. So there's really two types of or two buckets we can put hospital capital needs into. One I would call equipment, break fix, patient safety items. Think about pumps, monitors, hospital beds, etc. Those I would say are typically funded with cash flow right? So take the earnings, the bottom line of a hospital, and allocate a portion of it to routine capital needs. So typically that's cash or cash flow, what the hospital earns as an organization. The second bucket I would put into what I call strategic capital. Those are going to be bigger projects, longer lived, if you will, assets. So think about it as a patient tower, or a new cancer center, or building construction on a hospital campus. These are bigger projects. The buildings will be used for likely decades, and the cost is greater than, say, equipment. So a new building, depending on you know, where the hospital is located, right, healthcare is local, mm -hmm. could cost millions of dollars to construct, open, and operate. So for those, many not-for-profit hospitals issue debt or bonds in the market. There's all different types of debt, but putting debt, it's like buying a house and having a mortgage, Therese. It's the same mm -hmm. concept, right? You're not going to use cash. You're going to mm -hmm. go and get a mortgage. 
for these big projects, hospitals will typically consider issuing long-term debt. So two buckets, cash flow or long-term debt in the public markets. Well, let's talk about specifically how health systems use bonds and debt to fund their capital. So specifically, why would they want to issue bonds? Who purchases those bonds? And then given sort of what we're seeing out in the market, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about default. What what happens if an organization is unable to meet their bond requirements? So let's start with back to your comment about why would a health system issue bonds and, and who purchases those bonds? Right. A lot to unpack here. So the debt markets for -for not-for-profit healthcare, not-for-profit hospital systems typically issue debt in the, what's called the tax-exempt capital market. It is a specific market for 501c3 organizations, which is not-for-profit, or governments. So think about cities, counties, school districts, states, Governments are able to enjoy a low cost of borrowing in the tax exempt market. So, why would you issue debt? Well, it's very economical. It can be a low cost way to borrow funds to build that new tower. Like a mortgage, as I referenced, it can be over a long period of time, the repayment. So, typically, hospitals issue debt and the repayment is say 30 years. So it's not due in three years, the debt, it's stretched over a 30 year period, right? Because these buildings will be around for 30 years, 30 to 40 years. I I will say, Therese, we've seen a few not-for-profit health systems issue century bonds, 100 year bonds. That's a little bespoke, a little exotic. There's only a few, (laughs) but most are say 20 to 30 years. And thirdly, you know, why issue debt? It's a very tried and true market. This is a efficient market. The investors, which I'll talk about, they know what they're looking for. It is a well thought out, been around uh, really, I think, since the Tax Reform Act of 1986. That's when hospitals could start issuing debt in the tax exempt market. And the other benefit of issuing debt, I mean, you know, nobody likes to be over leveraged, right, personally mm-hmm. or for an organization. But borrowing low-cost debt allows a hospital or health system to use its cash for other purposes, to meet its mission, right? Develop access points, save money for an unexpected event like COVID, right? So, you know, we, we advocate that hospitals maintain cash reserves, and a way to do that is instead of spending for a big building, you borrow for it. If, you know, you borrow at the right time. So it's a very efficient market. So so let's say I'm a not-for-profit hospital and I want to build a new cancer center. It's going to cost me, say, $50 million. I issue debt. Well, what happens next? That's where the buy side, the investors come in. The investors also, these are typically large mutual funds. They may be banks, global banks, or individual like retail brokerage accounts. They're looking to put their investor money to work by making investments. And and usually when folks buy a not-for-profit hospital bond, they're not looking for high, crazy returns, right? That's like crypto, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not crypto. They're looking for safety of investments, safety of that return. So it's a very, overall, it's a very typically a safe investment, a well-known industry, not-for-profit healthcare is not going anywhere. It will be here, you know, forever, if you will. So the investor base is pretty sophisticated. They know and understand not-for-profit healthcare. So they know who they're lending the money to. And that's what they do. They lend millions of dollars to the hospital. And the hospital says, thank you very much. We will agree to repay you back every year, basically every year, principal plus an interest rate over the next, say, 30 years. So that's kind of the deal. We're going to lend you money, hospital, and the hospital says, thank you. We're going to build that tower, generate new cash flow, and we're going to repay you back. That is the essence of what a bond is. A bond is a promise to pay in its most simplest form. So you mentioned what I call the D word, uh, (laughs) default, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, default is not something we want in our vernacular, but it's, again, back to 
having a mortgage. You have to make your mortgage payments. Otherwise, you're in default and the bank can come in, you know, foreclose on your house. Similar to a bond, the hospital makes a promise to repay the debt every six months or annually, however it's scheduled. If they don't, if they don't send the money over to the trustee to make the payment, that is indeed a payment default. Those are very rare. They have happened over the years, but very rare. Typically, a hospital has cash in the bank to make that payment. And the dates of the interest payment dates, principal repayment dates are known, scheduled, and on the calendar. So a payment default is when a hospital does not make that payment. Again, rare, but it it has happened over the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. I think we're up to maybe, I don't know, 20 some over the past 30 years. When you think about, you know, there's 4,800 hospitals in the country. About 80% are not for profit. You know, if only 20 have actually missed a payment, that's pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you always want that number as low as possible. So that is, that is a payment default. The other type of default, not as egregious, but still not good, is a covenant default. So recall, you know, the bargain is we lend you money, hospital, and hospital says, we'll pay you back. As part of that, we'll pay you back. The hospital agrees, and it's in the documents, to maintain a certain level of financial performance and sometimes maintain a certain level of liquidity throughout the debt period. So a hospital says, we're going to operate our organization such that we maintain, say, two times coverage of our debt service, what's coming due every year, or we pledge to maintain, we'll always have 100 days of cash in the bank. These are financial covenants. They serve as guardrails, like a highway. You always want to stay right down the middle of your lane, driving down a highway. And if you veer too close to the guardrail, you know, that's too close to the edge. So these financial covenants, think of them as guardrails to keep the hospital operating at a certain level such that they are always in compliance with those financial covenants. So what we're seeing now, because of all the stressors that you mentioned, we expect there'll be many hospitals that violate those covenants. They come too close to that guardrail and maybe, you know, scratch up right against it, if not perhaps, you know, go through it. So we do anticipate, just like you said, with the labor issues The CARES Act funding is over. The public health emergency is about to be lifted. That concerns me just as an analyst, et cetera. Higher lengths of stay, all of the challenges that we are seeing, we do expect that there'll be more than usual, more hospitals and health systems that breach those covenants. So what happens next? You know, I didn't make the covenant, our cash dropped. This will be different for every hospital, it depends on what's inside their debt documents that they negotiated. It could be you bring in a consultant to help you fix your financial performance. That's probably like the most benign fix. And then on the other side of the spectrum, it could lead to acceleration, which means that you violate a covenant and your investors say, that's it, we're out. We want our money back today. That's pretty extreme. I don't think we've ever seen an acceleration. Usually agreements are worked out with the lenders, the investors, the banks to say, all right, you hit the guardrail. We're going to monitor your financial performance more closely, bring in the consultant. We want to see the improvement. We want a seat at the table basically to watch how the improvement is going. So the penalties will depend. uh, It's case by case as to what's inside the debt documents. So does that help? Very much so. So as you describe very articulately, sort of what is and recognizing that these covenants look different for each organization for each bond issuance. It seems that there are two parties that have a tremendous responsibility in making sure that these covenants are in compliance. And it sounds like That would be the board of directors and perhaps the finance committee 
but also the tremendous responsibility of the executives within the organization to maintain the financial integrity of the organization to meet those covenants. Am I correct in that assumption? And could you talk about each of those parties and what their role is relative to maintenance of these bond covenants? Yes. You know, I'll choose letter D, all of the above, right? (laughs) Um, Board of directors, finance committee, executives, chief financial officer, and and the entire organization. Everybody's got to be rowing in the same direction here, right? Which of course is to provide excellent patient care and maintain an enterprise with deep financial wherewithal Mm -hmm. to be fiduciarily responsible for the organization so that it can continue to meet its mission. Um, You run out of cash flow, you're not going to be able to provide the excellent standard of care that our hospitals do. And boy, they do it every day. They bring it every day. So yes, it is everyone's responsibility and, you know, taking it from the top, the board, typically it is a group of volunteers, essentially, for not-for-profit healthcare, and they are the face of the organization from a uh, fiduciary responsibility. They are entrusted with overseeing management, executive management, to ensure that all promises are kept, debt repayment, financial covenants. We often say, Therese, you know, we say to clients, you know, make those covenants, right? Because mm-hmm. if you don't, it's, it's very timely. It can be very costly. And investors remember, you know, they have mm-hmm. long-term memories. And if you missed a covenant, say four years ago, the next time you go to issue or borrow more debt, they remember. So for a host of reasons, a host of reasons for credibility purposes, we say, make your covenants. Now that said, you can have near misses, right? You can just crest over the financial requirement and just make that covenant. Think of it analogous to like, think about the Olympics and a high jumper, right? All you got to do is get over that bar without touching it. Same as a covenant. All you got to do is crest right above it. So you don't touch it, right? You don't violate the covenant, but truly that's no way to run an organization for the long term, right? Near misses are nail biters and you want to create adequate headroom, just like that high jumper to the bar, right? Mm -hmm. So that takes everybody's effort, board of directors, as I mentioned. We also advocate, you know, when I speak to boards, to not micromanage executive management. They are talented. This is what you've hired them for. Let them run the organization. That's what you've entrusted them to do. So executive management, you know, always reviewing financial performance, ensuring that They can see the road ahead, that they will be making those covenants right down the middle of the fairway, if you will. And they express, they cascade, you know, that message down to everyone uh, within an organization. Now, clinicians may not, you know, what do I have to do to help meet the covenants? And it's, it's really upon everybody. So we advocate that the message be socialized. Everybody, you know, pulls their weight, if you will, to ensure the most efficient care, you know, that's possible. At the end of the day, every six months or every year, it is the chief financial officer that must sign a compliance statement that says, we met our covenants, but that's a name on a form and it's, everyone's got to be involved. So we, you know, we advocate be transparent with the internal organization, everybody within, there are internal stakeholders, of course, be transparent with your lenders, be persistent, be consistent. And everybody has a part of this to ensure that the organization is fiscally responsible and can continue to operate in a healthy financial way to make the covenants and repay the debt. That is very helpful and certainly so relevant to nurse leaders who have such an important role to play in terms of the efficient and effective management of the operations of a health system. So let me do just a quick sort of sidebar here. So you have talked about bond ratings. I'd like to dig into that a little bit. So having come from that world, can you explain the bond rating system? We oftentimes 
will read that an organization is a A rated, triple A rated. Or, uh, you know, we all sort of hold our breaths and make sure that our organizations are never downgraded. I'd like for you, if you wouldn't mind, to explain a little bit about how that system works. Sure, sure. Happy to. And indeed, that's where I spent the first part of my career at uh, Moody's. Moody's is one of the three main bond rating agencies globally. All three companies are global. So recall where we started today. A hospital wants to build, say, a new tower. They borrow debt in the market. And with their team, they sell the debt to investors. Investors are looking for an independent assessment, analysis of, will this hospital truly be able to repay its debt over the next 30 years? So about 100 years ago, the rating agencies were born out of that need for an independent assessment, objective analysis, if you will, to evaluate, can this borrowing organization like a hospital or a city or a government, United States, a company, anyone who borrows debt in the market, can they repay the debt? And the rating spectrum was born. Think of it, Therese, like a grading system, you know, in school, right? You get an A plus or an A or a B, C, D, F. It's along a scale and the letters are the same, but with some slight differences. So the highest rating in the land is AAA not the auto club, uh, AAA (laughs) by the bond rating companies. And let me give you an example. So who's rated AAA? Who who have the rating agency said to the investors, this is a perfect, we see no chance of a payment default ever. So who is AAA? Harvard University, say, is AAA. Global demand, global brand, huge endowment, right, as you perhaps would imagine, Mm -hmm. that covers their debt, I don't know, five times over, you know, they could pay their debt five times, whatever that number is. I don't know Mm -hmm. what it is, but it's extremely strong. That's one example. The state of Texas happens to be AAA rated, you know, big economy, oil, et cetera, you know, huge growth center of the country. That's another example. So the bond rating agencies assign ratings to anyone that wants a rating, anyone that borrows debt in the market. And all three rating agencies have portfolios of ratings for -for not-for-profit hospitals and not-for-profit healthcare systems. The ratings are maintained basically while the debt is outstanding. So it could be years, decades. And what a hospital system wants to do is get the highest rating possible. Why? The rating is an important component, not the only one, but an important component that will determine when you go to sell debt in the market, you know, how attractive the price will be or the yield will be, right? You want to go for the lowest cost of capital and a bond rating can help determine that cost of capital, right? You want to borrow at 2%, not 10%. Bond ratings can factor into that along with many other factors. So bond ratings are important. The three rating agencies have teams of analysts that assess not-for-profit healthcare systems. They look at a host of financial metrics, market share, quality indicators, leverage, of course, indicators, trying to assess on a scale, like an academic scale, what the likelihood is of repayment, i.e., what is the chance of a default. So that's what the rating agencies do. The ratings are public. The investors look to them to make their decisions, and ratings are updated usually annually, maybe every two years by the analysts. And what what you strive for is to either have that rating affirmed, it doesn't change, or it goes up, right? Like you want an A, not a B rating, like in school, right? However, with the pressures of healthcare, we typically see more downgrades in not-for-profit hospital ratings every year than upgrades. So more down than up. We've seen that, you know, during the pandemic. That said, investors have said to the agencies, look, you know, this is not shareholders. This is not stock. We don't want the ratings changing every quarter. We want you to rate through 
these difficult times right through the ice patch, if you will. So most ratings actually ever, every year are affirmed. They stay in place. That's very good news, I think, for the industry to know. But mm-hmm. you want to try and avoid the downgrade because downgrades, when you come back to the market, it will just cost more to borrow. So you want to, you know, the goal is to keep the rating where it is, if not maybe be upgraded. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of the essence of a bond rating. And if you are downgraded and that does happen, it's not, you know, an indictment of strategy. Likewise, an upgrade is not, you know, you guys have the best strategy. In its core, in its essence, it's a measurement to signal to bondholders the risk. The risk was either, you know, heightened, i.e. a downgrade or lessened, i.e. an upgrade, depending on, you know, financial performance, issuing debt. You know, if a hospital has a hundred million dollars of debt outstanding and they say, boy, we're on a growth strategy, we're going to issue a billion more of debt. Mm -hmm. Chances are you're going to be downgraded, right? You can't have a hundred million and then absorb a billion, Mm -hmm. you know, and say, well, you're an A today, you're still an A tomorrow. In their essence, they're, they're measuring that ability to repay that debt. And when you add a lot of debt, maybe you add a lot of debt to build a new tower, but the tower won't open for four years they may say, look, the pressure is now. You're adding the debt today. It's too much for the category. We're going to downgrade you. And then when you open up the tower, if it goes as planned and you deleverage, you know, then we'll talk about maybe an upgrade. So they're very dynamic, but they endeavor to rate through these cycles. I see. That is very helpful in sort of building a context for the world that we find ourselves in. Have you noticed, have there been a significant number of downgrades relative to history as a result of the pandemic and the financial challenges that it has brought? Have you noticed a difference in that? Yeah, great question. I'll tell you, in March of 2020, right, when this thing called coronavirus Mm -hmm. showed up, right, you know, I didn't know how to pronounce it. Perhaps we didn't know at the time how how to treat it clinically. And, you know, at Moody's, we were tasked with go figure it out, right? If we're Mm -hmm. in the middle of this, you know, health crisis in this country, we got to make sure these ratings are right. You know, and and at the time, Moody's had about, I don't know, 400 hospital ratings. So it's like, how do we do this? So we, if I may, Therese, we triaged, Mm -hmm. right? Just just like a hospital. And Mm -hmm. we looked at all the financial metrics. We looked at who's got cash, who's got enough cash to pay off their debt. You know, is it over 100% or under 100%? We looked at days cash on hand. We looked at leverage metrics. And by doing that, we were able to really isolate who we needed to get on the phone with right away. That said, I just looking at the three rating agencies in the past, say, three years, there have not been a ton of downgrades, in part because the CARES Act. To Mm -hmm. me, the CARES Act was swift and substantial, right? Mm -hmm, The industry, mm -hmm. you know, once again, found its voice, went to Congress, the funding came through, and it it was, to me, very large funding. So the CARES Act came through, and also the Medicare Advance loans came through. If you wanted, Mm -hmm. you raised your hand, Medicare injected cash into the hospital. They gave you a six-month advance, essentially, on your Medicare payments coming in. Now, that second bucket has been repaid. It was a loan, not a grant. But the CARES Act and the injection of cash helped stabilize a very uncertain time. So we have not seen a tremendous rise in downgrades. And I will tell you, just looking back, there were more downgrades in 2008, 2009, during the Great Recession. Interesting. Yes, yes. So remember, remember in October of 2008, I think it was October, The debt markets, the capital markets were absolutely upside down, complete disruption, the mortgage-backed securities, et cetera, just derailed the high-functioning capital markets. And so the markets basically froze. And many hospitals, now we know better, many hospitals had some risky debt instruments in their debt structures, and they went sideways. Mm -hmm. That did correct itself, but then we had the Great Recession. People lost their jobs, lost their health care, volumes went down, or if volumes were there, there was a lot of uninsured, as we know. It was Mm -hmm. before the Affordable Care Act. 
So it was actually 08 and 09 that at least at Moody's, Therese, it was a downgrade a week. So we had, you know, about 60 downgrades in, I guess it was 2009. We've not seen that with a pandemic, believe it or not, because the CARES Act funding, because Mm -hmm. quite frankly, management teams took very swift action. I mean, there was just no fooling around here. Mm -hmm. Boards met, you know, management Mm -hmm. team on the Zoom. What are we going to do? These are our options. Tough decisions, but very fast decisions. And the industry, once again, you know, love it or leave it, was resilient. Mm -hmm. Once again, resilient. So we've not seen a lot of rating movement between the resiliency and the additional funding like we did in 08. And if you ask me, well, what about prior to 08? I was also Mm -hmm. (laughs) looking... The stress before that, the crisis before that was uh, with the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, which hit financial performance negatively in 1998. And basically, as I understand it, Medicare, Medicare basically froze rates to hospitals. And we know the expenses weren't frozen, right? Expenses went up, but, you know, Medicare is the largest consumer, right? We treat our seniors. In 1998 and 1999, there were... I am just going to round up, round off about 50 downgrades. So about one a week in 1998. So 1998, 2008, those were the peak years of very high downgrade activity. And it's a very challenging time right now. There are downgrades, but not to that level that we saw in those crises. So, but downgrades do happen for most of the three rating agencies, there's typically more downgrades than upgrades, but by and large, most ratings are just held in place. So it's been a very interesting analysis of the industry and its financial performance using ratings as a guide point. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting and uh, surprising, actually. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, What an interesting observation. So Let me end by asking some very practical questions. So you've sort of given us a a big picture. Why would an organization issue bonds to help fund capital needs? You've taught us a little bit about the agencies and, and their role in rating. You've also talked about what happens when a covenant is breached, when an organization sort of bumps up against the guardrails that lenders will will put in place? You mentioned that a consultant report may be one of those next steps. So right. that the lenders want to know that an organization is taking this very seriously and putting those plans in place. And sort of from my worldview of helping organizations address those plans to help develop those plans and teach executives about what their role is. Can you talk about the role of the executive team in creating and executing that plan? What should they be thinking about? What should that plan include? And how does that Overlie what's going on with the hospital's operations. Yeah, this is, you know, what I'm learning too today, kind of in the weeds of this. But the executive team, if they, if the documents require you bring in a consultant, uh, they very much have to work in partnership with the consultant, an external firm, to develop a long term plan of sustainability so that you make the covenants and there's, there's no near misses, right? We talked about headroom. And I, as I'm learning in my new role, the sustainability plan focuses on everything from operations to you know, balance sheet management. So a P&L focus, if you will, cash flow statement and balance sheet statement. So all three parts of the financial three-legged stool. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, you know, Again, a focus on operations, efficiency. You mentioned earlier length of stay, uh, labor challenges. It's the use of data and metrics, algorithms, et cetera, to talk about, you know, we may be in a a workforce shortage, but perhaps, you know, there's productivity aspects we can apply to get us back on track financially so that 
next year we do make the covenant because you need to come back and make the covenant. You don't really have a second option to miss it again. So there's strategies on the expense side, the operating side. There are strategies on you know, the back office revenue side with revenue cycle and mm-hmm. efficiencies there. There's a lot I'm learning about it too, but it's got to be in partnership because of at some point the consultants leave and they mm-hmm. turn the plan over to management and management has to execute on this plan to get the operations back such that they do make the covenants. Well, thank you. This has been so incredibly informative and so important for us as nursing leaders to understand sort of all of the background here and the critical role that we play in making sure that all of these pieces come together and do so in a way that we don't breach these really important covenants. It is part of our commitment to our communities, and uh, we play a very, very important role in this. So Lisa, thank you so much. We have enjoyed talking with you today and look forward to inviting you back. I would be delighted and thank you so much for calling me and, and happy to talk more whenever you like. Thank you. Great. Thank you. The Nursing Economics Podcast Series is owned and produced by Genetti Publications Incorporated, all rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without written permission. Ms. Lisa Goldstein is a Senior Vice President at Kaufman Hall & Associates in New York, New York, and is a nationally renowned healthcare expert. Dr. Therese Fitzpatrick is a senior vice president at Kaufman Hall and Associates and a member of the performance improvement practice specializing in workforce strategy. She is also an assistant professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and is a member of the Nursing Economics Editorial Board. For archived episodes of this podcast and to learn more about nursing economics, visit the journal's website at nursingeconomics.net. You can also subscribe to the Nursing Economics Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, our hosting site Spreaker, and everywhere podcasts are found. And remember, as a listener, you can save 50% off one- and two-year subscriptions to Nursing Economics. Simply visit nursingeconomics.net Click subscribe and enter promo code NEC SAVE50 to take advantage of this special discount.